Well, it's at the Boston Marathon bombings investigation. They're moving forward, and new information is coming out about Tamerlan Sarnaev, the now deceased 26 year old who, along with his brother, is accused of setting off those explosions. Now, it turns out both the FBI and the CIA were contacted by Russian officials on separate occasions about Tamerlan Sarnaev's as early as 2011, after Sarnaev's visit to Russia. Now, the FBI says it responded to the, to the calls, putting Sarnaev on the U.S. terrorist watch list and even interviewing Sarnaev and his family, but turned up nothing. Now, this has prompted some U.S. lawmakers to question the intelligence gap and other in part lying blame on Russia for not cooperating. But Russian President Vladimir Putin indicated yesterday to press that the two countries could unite to fight terrorism. Now, I was joined earlier to talk about this by Stephen Cohen, and I first asked him what the past contact between the two nations on the Cernives radicalization has to say about the state of the U.S. relations with Russia. Well, it's hard to know. Uh, Congress is investigating now whether there was a bureaucratic failure uh, in the United States. But quite a few warnings were received from the Russian intelligence services, and not only about uh, one of the brothers, the older brother, who died in Boston, but about the mother. And there seemed to have been at least three or four messages from the FSB, the Russian intelligence services, not only to the FBI, as initially reported, but to the CIA. One possibility uh, is, of course, that it was a bureaucratic failure. Another possibility is, is that poor relations between Moscow and Washington uh, devalued the Russian report. And when I say poor relations, I mean particularly the very anti-Putin, anti-Kremlin atmosphere. Because once that starts at the highest level, in the media, in the White House, or in the Congress, it spreads to all American bureaucratic agencies. So it is possible. I don't know if it's likely, but it's possible that the S FBI just didn't take this seriously, chalked it up uh, to a human rights issue, having nothing to do with terrorism. Mm -hmm. But in any event, whatever the original uh, uh, reason to devalue the Russian report, they didn't follow up when the brother returned to the United States after six or seven months in, in, in Dagestan. And that really is inexplicable. Well, Stephen, I want to take you to um Senator, rather, Florida Senator Bill Nelson had this to say about the investigation. Let's take a listen. The FBI and all law enforcement responded very well. And, uh, you know, this uh, stuff about Russia warned us. Well, we uh, inquired of Russia several times, and Russia didn't respond. So the FBI and our intelligence community was all over this. Okay, Stephen, so what do you make of this? Because reports show that the U.S. intel agencies, both the FBI and the CIA, both had Tamerlan Sarnaev on their radar thanks to tips from the Russian government. And if both governments were communicating, what else could have been done to prevent this from happening? Well, if the congressman thinks that the FBI and the CIA did a full and adequate job, obviously we need a new FBI and a new CIA. Uh, we're not safe at all. I think that the problem, and certainly you hear this coming from the congressman, is the relationship between Washington and Moscow. Uh, here's the basic problem. Uh, Putin, the Kremlin, Moscow, have one narrative about what's going on in the world. And Washington, the White House, the Congress have a different narrative. And this extends all the way from the Russian uh, provinces of Chechnya and, and Dagestan to the Middle East. The United States sees all this, or most of this uh, kind of uh, rebellion in Islamic areas as a kind of democratic insurgency. Uh, Washington thinks the Arab Spring is about democracy. Uh, Putin and the Russian leadership view this very differently, partly because Russia is also an Islamic country with 20 million Muslim citizens. The position in Moscow has been, beginning with the war in Chechnya and now the uh, anti-terrorist operations in, in Dagestan, is this isn't about democracy, and these people aren't rebels, they're terrorists. So the narrative extends all the way from Russia to the Middle East, because Putin's view of the Middle East is the same, that the forces that have been unleashed in the Middle East, the anti-establishment forces, aren't democratic, they're, they're extreme Islamic forces that are going to produce more terrorism. Until Moscow and Washington can resolve these conflicting narratives, the kind of cooperation 
that you want from our intelligence services and the Russian intelligence services is going to be limited. The problem is, is that we're in a kind of Cold War situation, and it's characteristic of Cold War that you get conflicting narratives. They don't add up. They're in opposition. I see. Stephen, that's, that's interesting. So because Russia gave our intel these tips, couldn't they now say, we told you so? They could say it, but it wouldn't be a good idea. The best thing is to try to figure out what went wrong and fix the problem. I thought what Putin said yesterday, uh, Thursday, in his uh, marathon press conference, he didn't speak at length about Boston, but he said, but in kinder words, we told you so. And he made the point about his narrative uh, that I just mentioned. He said the problem has been over the years that Washington has looked at these areas in Russia, particularly Chechnya and Dagestan, uh, as having to do with human rights and democracy. Whereas the Kremlin has said, no, no, no. This is about terrorism. It involves international terrorism. And we should be on the same side of this. So to that extent, Putin yesterday said, we told you so, but he didn't rub it in Obama's. And, and, and remember one other thing, it's very, very important. After the events in Boston, it was not Obama who called Putin, it was Putin who called Obama. The same thing happened, by the way, when Putin called President George Bush after the attack on America in 9-11. The Russian side has been urging cooperation embracing the idea of full cooperation in this area of fighting terrorism. The Americans, for whatever reason, ideological, bureaucratic, we Americans have dragged our feet. Stephen, so I want to talk to you about our counterterrorism strategies. Uh, since 9-11, we've seen an increase in the efforts to strengthen counterterrorism strategies, both here and abroad. What do you think the events in Boston say about those efforts? And are we better off than we were 12 years ago? I don't know. I mean, clear, I mean, whether we're better off or not better off, the fact remains we're all still in danger. Whether you live in, 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 in Moscow, where I often live, or whether you live in Boston, or whether you live in New York, anybody in a large city, anybody who gets on a subway, anybody who flies, uh, people who take trains, uh, these are targets for terrorists now around the world. It's happening in Europe as well. Uh, what to do about it? clearly, first of all, requires a major cooperation between Russia and the United States. They have the two most informed intelligence services. That hasn't happened. Secondly, it, regards, it involves a completely different kind of dialogue. It's stripped of its Cold War components. Uh, where you go beyond that, I think, is only one other place. There's a debate in the United States, uh, and I think a, f a rather foolish debate in a way. Uh, it's distracting us from the main issue. How did these two brothers, in the United States, most of their adult lives, become Islamic uh, radicals, if that's what they were? I assume that's what they were. Were they self-radicalized? Did they pick this up on the Internet? Did they go to Russia? Uh, what happened? here is, is that this kind of radical jihadist uh, uh, terrorism is an ideology. It's a religious ideology. And we know from the history of 20th century, long before the Internet, that ideas migrate. Uh, Marxism came from France and Germany and England to Russia. There was no Internet. Ideas travel. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter why these two guys, uh, how they got their ideas. They got them. Now, why were they receptive to them? Partly because maybe they came from the North Caucasus. They were returning. But there's one other important thing, which we're not discussing in the United States, because it's awkward in the United States. Apparently, the younger Professor brother, Cohen, I, that's, I hate to cut you off, but just really quickly, you mentioned yesterday's press conference, and Russian President Vladimir Putin had this to say about the attacks. We're going to play it uh, over terrorism in general. Take a listen. Common Americans are not to be blamed. They don't understand what is happening. Here I am, addressing them and our citizens to say that Russia, too, is a victim of international terrorism. I was always appalled when our Western partners and the Western media labeled terrorists who committed bloody crimes in our country as insurgents and almost never as terrorists. These groups received intelligence, financial and political support, sometimes directly and sometimes indirectly. We said declarations merely proclaiming terrorism a common threat were not enough we must get the job done 
those two have proven our position all too well. Well, Stephen, really quickly because we're running out of time, but is this very, a very different point of view uh, normally that we've seen in the U.S.? Uh, so we've been told that terror has a face, yet this is the notion that negates this fact. Uh, does terror indeed have a nationality? What Putin just said is exactly the point I was making earlier. There are two narratives about what is being called terrorism. The American narrative has been for 15 years or so that it's somehow about human rights and democracy. The Russian narrative has been that it's about terrorism, whether we're talking about the North Caucasus in Russia or about the Middle East. That is the point Putin made yesterday in his press conference. It's a point of view that is not heard widely in the United States. It may be that Boston will make that point of view more widely known in America. Okay, it Professor may... Cohen, so are we, pardon me for interrupting you, sir, but are we going to see these two countries working more closely in the future to combat terrorism? Is this, has this issue been an in, inadvertent reset of sorts? They will fix some of the bureaucratic lapses that evidently occurred between the Russian intelligence services and the Americans, but any long-term uh, cooperation in this area will require resolving other conflicts between the two countries. And about that, I'm not optimistic. Okay. Well, thank you so much, sir. That was Stephen Cohen, author and professor of Russian studies at New York University.